I'd like to call to order the October 20th, 2011 meeting of the Johns County Community College Board of Trustees, and we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Dear Schlitt, can you do the roll call and recognition of visitors, please? This evening's visitors include Richard France and Anna Mott. All right, thank you for being here. Is Anna not here or not? We're now at the, uh, the first of two petitions and communication sections of the board agenda. And this is a time for the members of the community to provide their comments to the board. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan on speaking. And in that instance, the uh, chair may limit a person's comments to less than five minutes. Presenters may choose to speak at either the first or second petition and communication section, but not both. And prior to beginning the comments, we ask that you state your name, address, city, and state. And do we have anyone that would like to address the board at this time? I'd seen none. We will close uh, the, the first one. We'll have another opportunity later uh, in the meeting. And we'll move to uh, uh, awards and recognitions. And Dr. Grove, what do you have for us? Thank you, Chair Weiss. I'd like to ask for, uh, Lisa Waldman to come to the podium and receive an, an award from Chair Weiss. Uh, uh, Elisa works in our Small Business Development Center. And she was recently selected as the 2011 State Star of the Kansas Small Business Development Center Network and as star performer for the Association of Small Business Development Centers, which is a nationwide organization. Uh, she, these awards were given to her because um, she exhibits initiative, creativity, and work ethic in helping clients realize their dream of owning their own small businesses. So congratulations to you, Lisa. Thank you very much. And as a former uh, uh, business owner, I can't think of a, a place that would be more fun to work uh, in this campus than the Small Business Development Center. So congratulations there. All right, Mr. Carter, do you have a, a lobbyist report for us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the <coughs> Board of Trustees. Um, the good news this month is state revenues are once again up. We've completed the first quarter of the fiscal year, and September end of month uh, earnings were $27 million uh, above expected revenues. Uh, interestingly, $15.7 million of that is from the individual income tax, which has been relatively flat, uh, if not somewhat down, over the, over the past, uh, past several months. Uh, sales tax, they're calling flat uh, at an increase of $6 million more than they expected. It's still an increase, but I think when, when you look at the overall budget numbers, uh, they're just sort of preparing themselves, bracing, and also <clears throat> taking into account that uh, many of the numbers in September will, will account for back-to-school purchases uh, in many cases. The, uh, the numbers present uh, an interesting picture. If, if we continue on this trend right now, uh, we'd be ending up uh, with about $225 million in the bank at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, that presents a, a good news, bad news picture for legislators that are making uh, the, the tough budget decisions that, that we'll be talking about throughout the, uh, the course of next legislative session. November 4th uh, is, is always sort of the halfway uh, well, it's not a halfway, halfway point for the fiscal year, but it's the, uh, the looking forward uh, point where the consensus revenue estimating group gets together. It's a group of state economists, some uh, university folks, uh, folks that uh, do the fiscal policy in, in the legislative process get together and they, they take a, uh, a budget picture and, and a outlook, if you will, for what the coming budget year looks like. That group will be getting together uh, again on November 4th, and that is uh, in large part what, uh, what helps both the governor and, and the legislature um, use as a base for, for formulating their budget numbers. The, uh, I decided to start with the, the budget uptick this, this month because it was good news. Uh, I've been talking about taxes for the past couple of, uh, of uh, board meetings, and, and while there's been no um, movement on the tax issue, uh, that continues to be in the rumor mill. Um, what uh, 
what legislators uh, have in mind, what uh, the governor's office has in mind, are, are still somewhat uh, blurry right now. The, uh, there is a little bit of an interesting um, flap, if you will. The Lawrence Journal World has, uh, has requested an open <coughs> records request of the governor's office for who is participating in the tax panel discussions. Uh, the governor's office has uh, indicated that it might take several weeks to provide that information, uh, and, and that, that date, um, uh, it doesn't exactly correspond with the convening of the legislature, but, uh, but it comes close. So we'll see if, if that uh, information produces any, anything for uh, who has been participating in the behind-the-scenes uh, tax discussions uh, led, by the, led by the administration. Uh, interestingly, uh, Senate President Steve Morris has formed a tax panel uh, made up of uh, his tax chairman, uh, Senator Donovan, Les Donovan from Wichita. Also on that uh, committee will be uh, Dick Kelsey, Rich Longbine, Vicki Schmidt, and Senator Tom Holland. Uh, those folks will begin taking a, a more public look as it's being billed uh, at, at possible tax policy changes. Uh, Senator Morris did that. Uh, formed that group sort of in response to the fact that uh, there's, there's been a quite a bit of discussion going on behind the scenes and, and not much uh, has been discussed in the public. It'll be interesting also to see uh, how, the, uh, how the committee lines up. Senator Morris doesn't always uh, line up directly with, with the Brownback administration uh, and, and the two people uh, in particular that are, are uh, chair and vice chair of this task force uh, are, are very conservative. One is a uh, automobile dealership owner. In fact, two people on the committee own, own automobile, automobile dealerships. Those folks are very interested in, in a number of types of taxes, as you might imagine. So it'll be interesting to see what, what comes out of that group. Uh, no scheduled meetings uh, are on the books as of yet. We're beginning to hear rumblings of uh, K-12 uh, finance, uh, reformulating of, of the finance formula. Uh, what should be of concern uh, to those of you sitting around the table and, and those in the listening audience is um, one, one of the proposals would be a 10 to 15 mil uh, off the top redistribution to areas that have lower uh, property valuations. Um, that's coming off the 20 mil um, statewide uh, levy. That means uh, people like Johnson County Schools lose. The, uh, the other uh, issue of concern would be that while uh, many school districts across the state have shown support for their, for their various districts by either enhancing or maintaining the budgets through local sales tax options or increasing the, uh, the property mill to whatever a lid might be. Um, one, of the, one of the discussion items being discussed would be to remove move those lids uh, and allow those districts that then want to um, make up the difference or maybe stay whole uh, to increase their, their local uh, property tax. Again, something that we need to be uh, very concerned about is, as we continue to, to look at uh, our own budget here at the com community college. The, um, the other component that uh, was being discussed at, before a group of uh, school administrators was a possible technical education grant. Now, why it was being discussed at a, a KSDE type function, I'm not sure, since that's part of the, uh, the oversight of the Board of Regents, and, and it could have been just these are some of the things that we're going to be doing. I don't have the specific details on that, but I, but I include that because that's an <coughs> important component of, of the type of education that we provide as well. Uh, turning the page to redistricting, uh, as we speak, that process should be just about concluded as far as the 14 town hall meetings are concerned. Uh, the committee has been on the road in Dodge City, Garden City, Colby, and Hayes, and they're, they're wrapping up in Hayes this afternoon. Uh, that process now moves to the general legislative process. I can guarantee you that many legislators, many interested parties continue to draw maps and will continue to draw legislative district maps, um, both now and, and through the, the start of the legislative session. Uh, legislators have until the middle or so of March to pass a bill uh, that would include maps for uh, congressional redistricting in the, uh, the House and Senate districts in the state and forward that to the, uh, the governor's office for signature, then which goes off to the Supreme Court for their review. Uh, the process is if the court uh, says that the maps aren't uh, workable, it goes back to the legislative process and we start over. Legislators have until roughly June 10th or the filing deadline uh, to formulate those those maps for this particular round of, of redistricting. And uh, there have been quite a bit of input, but uh, no real substantive progress made thus far. The, um, 
a bit of another bit of good news. Um, you probably saw a uh, a press release and, and heard from uh, college administrators that uh, we were the recipients of a, a Department of Labor grant to the tune of about two point nine million dollars. Um, those dollars will will assist in funding some uh, high tech jobs related to the uh, health technology systems, and it fits nicely with the uh, the expansion of the Olathe campus uh, that that was just dedicated uh, a week or two ago. Um, that was a result of a team effort, and, and a number of people um, were uh, continually uh, reminding folks in Washington, D.C. of the importance of, of those grants, and, and while the, uh, the delegates' uh, offices don't make those decisions themselves, they, they play an important role in helping um, bring those dollars back to Kansas. So uh, a little bit of a pat on the back for the team here at Johnson County Community College that, that helped uh, bring those dollars here. Finally, then, uh, is an issue that we've been talking about for, for a couple of meetings. I've included uh, a bill that was introduced this past legislative session and would have been one that uh, I had in, in my reports. However, it was a bill that never really went anywhere. The good news is it's a bill that was introduced through the Appropriations Committee, so it's still alive, even though it, it never had a hearing. Uh, I believe that it could serve as a good base for um, looking at uh, some of the issues that, that uh, concern us related to publishing uh, public notices in, in newspapers, and, and we find ourselves in a bit of a quandary when it, when it comes to that. A couple of interesting points. Um, it, it allows, and, and this bill speaks mainly to county and city municipalities, <coughs> but, it, but it, I believe it can be expanded to governing bodies in general. Uh, even, even if that's not possible, we could still um, use this basis for formulating one that, uh, if, if you are so interested or so inclined in, in proposing such, that would uh, allow for the publication of public notices on, on the internet. It allows for papers, newspapers, or um, internet notices. And uh, the three components that are contained in this particular bill, it must the, the internet site must not be password protected, it must be accessible to members of the general public, and no fee shall be charged for access to the information. Um, I do believe it's interesting uh, as you read through the bill that one of the components is for, for cities or municipalities of first class nature uh, that the, uh, if, if you're using a newspaper, utilizing a newspaper for your publication notices, um, the newspaper must be published in the county. If one is not published in the county, then it must be published in Kansas. The newspaper must be published in, in the state of Kansas. We find ourselves in, and again, a little bit of a, of a problem when it, when it comes to that, even though we're not treated as a, a city of first class or, or a separate type of governing body. I just, I just found that to be interesting. The, um, I might stop there. That, I, I bring it to you not as a proposal. That bill could be brought up for a hearing and, and could be amended, and, and I think that's probably an easy route. Um, but one of the things that, that uh, I have had conversations with, with Dr. Tompkins along with uh, Dr. Calloway um, at, at the regent level would be to get their support, and, and he has indicated that, that they would be supportive of our initiatives or our efforts to, to change that law. It would be, um, it would be a, a tough climb. Um, we know that the, uh, the newspaper uh, association would, would likely be uh, working hard against it, but I, I believe there's a way to incorporate them and include them in a way that, that uh, everyone benefits. So I would stop there and, and see if there's any, any questions. Chairman Weiss, thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter, um, I appreciate your optimism on the revenue collection, uh, but I believe the legislature still expects to operate with a 7% rainy day fund, and if you take 7% of the budget, it's still quite a bit higher than the $200 million they're proposing. So while we might believe the revenue is on the uptick, I, I still believe there's a big gap to go before anyone should feel comfortable that we're in really good shape. You're absolutely correct, and we have a number of other obligations that will be coming due as well that, uh, that will require uh, that type of money to, to pay the bills. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Trustee Sharp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I don't know if this is necessarily a, a question for Mr. Carter or for our, our, our budgeteers, but um, <clears throat> the main problem with this piece of legislation, the, um, the publishing the publications le legislation has always been that people are afraid to go against their local papers and it makes sense for everybody everybody sitting in this room understands and thinks that yeah you should be able to post these public notices on the internet but the press association is ardently opposed because that's where they get the bulk of their their revenue stream which makes sense why they would oppose it but my my question is for our organization how much do we spend 
in a year on average or how much do we have budgeted to spend just to buy newsprint for our publications? Between nine and ten thousand dollars. A year? Okay. And we print we publish in used to be the Sun, now we publish have to publish in the Star? Uh, no. no. Right now the legal record is the first oh, okay. one, but we could also do the Gardner's News and Shawnee Dispatch. Okay. Okay, and is that, do we know if that's, I guess we wouldn't know if that's average for the other surrounding? Um, the, um, well, the prices for the sun and the prices for the legal record are very similar. Yeah. That's the only comparison I have. Okay. I'm just curious. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, if I might, yes. the only thing I would add to uh, uh, conversation and to Mr. Carter's comments was that, in fact, today at the Regents' meeting, there was discussion about this issue and the regents do have this on their, um, had it on their agenda for a first read. And there was some conversation very similar to what we've had here today. Um, the pluses and the minuses and the challenges are also related to the press association. So um, it did go through um, on first read and there were a couple of questions of us and shared with them some of the um, <coughs> challenges we face with getting public information out. And also I think, you know, if, if we would talk to Mitch Borchers from our procurement area, he would say to us, you know, today we get a high percentage of our responses to our RFPs and some of our other bids actually through our internet um, activity as compared to say when we put it in the paper. So um, we're actually getting a much broader um, response in that regard. So um, it's, it, it certainly wouldn't be, it's not going to be an easy test, but it's something that, you know, would certainly help us in a, in a real way. So. Thank you. Okay. I'd just like to, to add that uh, there doesn't <coughs> seem to be anything in this bill that addresses the issue of uh, how accessible or easy to find that information might be on a uh, governing body's website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it doesn't even speak to a specific website. So I, I don't disagree that there are needs right. for improvement to the, to the particular piece of legislation. Okay. All right, thank you. Anything else? Mr. Carter, thank you. We'll move to uh, committee reports and recommendations and begin with the management uh, committee and trustee Dr. Uh, Drummond. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would direct your attention <coughs> to uh, tab two. Behind tab two, you'll find the paperwork pertaining to the uh, management committee, pages one through 18. Uh, we'd like to begin tonight by suggesting that we uh, met on the 10th of October and you'll find the recommendations of which there are four on um, pages one through five in the board packet. Uh, the first recommendation you'll find is a uh, proposed amendment to board policy uh, 21706, which refers to the service of alcoholic beverages on campus-owned properties. The actual uh, recommended policy and operating procedures are featured on pages 6 through 8, if you want to turn to that in your board packet. Specifically, these revisions amend the operating procedures and policy to include uh, the Carlson Center, Recital Hall, uh, the Carlson Center stages and staging areas in the Latha Health Education Center, uh, room 102, and respective lobbies. Uh, the administration and the, and the management committee looked at this very closely, and uh, it is our recommendation that the management committee, that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college mm -hmm. administration to approve the amendment to the board policy 217. 06, service of alcohol beverages as shown on pages 6 through 8 in the board packet. And I would so move that. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, I simply had a question about, uh, you got rid of some of the really specific restrictions, which made some sense to allow some more flexibility. <coughs> One of the things that looks like you got rid of to me was the president in the past had the right to establish rules and regulations to implement the policy. And that looks like it's been stricken. The, is that, was that was there a particular reason for that? I, it seemed to me like that was a discretionary function that made sense to rest in Dr. Calloway's lap, but it's at the... Uh, I think what we've done is just kind of simplify the language under um, on page seven, top of the page, where it says the procedures um, shall be in full compliance, you know, as di dictated by my office, will be in full compliance with the laws that govern all of this, so. We're just trying to simplify it a bit. I assume you're still in charge. <laughs> I was yesterday. <laughs> I've been gone most of today. So. If you're comfortable, I'm comfortable. 
Thank you. Uh, Trustee Sharp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had a quick question. As I was reading through this, tell me if I'm, I I'm kind of confused. On the first page under, um, the, well, sorry, on page nine, mm -hmm. under the first bullet, A, it says no alcoholic beverage sale is permitted. And then if you turn to the next page, under category two, it allows cash bars or catered or ticketed. Uh, and then I went to an event <clears throat> probably a week or two ago where they sold tickets in the atrium. You sold a ticket and then you gave the bartender your ticket. I didn't know how that policy works in with the new one, if that's in conflict where no alcoholic beverage sale is permitted and then cash bars. I just didn't understand that. I'm going to turn to our legal counsel because this is some of our legalese that we have some advice on. I'm going to So maybe what we should do is bring these back, go, go through the legal office and make sure that we bring those back to answer that question. I simply say that we did recently renew the uh, liquor license and we did suggest that, uh, that the policy be changed to, to at least include other areas okay. uh, and, right. and to be in compliance with the updated liquor license that we get with the state and with the, the city of Oval Park. But, uh, I've not been asked for reviews or the specific policy language. I'd be happy to do that. There might be a distinction between special events and regular sales. We're not in the business of having a, an open bar regularly, but when it comes to a special event, that creates kind of an exception to the rule. Right. That, that's a, a part of what this is about. I just didn't know if we should have, you know, a, a notwithstanding in there or something. That there's a blanket comment about no al alcoholic beverage sale is permitted and then later says we can. So I just didn't know if that was in conflict. No, I didn't. Am I the only one that read that wrong? The, the one thing I would I, the one thing I would share is that we are voting on the policy. The operating procedure is one we can tweak. Um, right. Yeah. So that might be part what we might want to do is um, take the consideration of the policy and then if there are issues as we work, work with uh, Tanya and Mark then we can we can tweak the procedure kind of offline. But I, but I think those are good questions that we need to make sure we just double check that we're following the right process. Just for further clarification, to directly respond to your question, I mean, we have a liquor license for the <coughs> area in the and then the caterer license is, is um, for the other area. And so that's where the tickets come kind of in. Providing ticket, drink tickets for those, which we're allowed to then allow uh, alcohol uh, consumption in those areas, but you're not correctly selling them uh, regular. Over the counter. Right. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'm ready to vote for it. I, I think it's clear between what the uh, policy is and what the uh, procedures are to back it up. I, I didn't really see the conflict at all that's being discussed. So I'd, I'd be ready to vote on the motion. All right. Well, let, let me ask uh, uh, is it the feeling of the board that we want to separate? The, the policy from the procedure and just vote on, on the on the policy or do we want to proceed with the entire thing? Actually the board's responsibility is to deal with the procedure oh, and the then procedure. the policy. Okay. Or, I'm sorry with the policy, oh, policy. and then the procedure right. is more administrative and if there's a, a you know a tweaking okay. that we need to do then we we can kind of do that offline. But really the board would just be voting on the policy. All right. I, I think right. perhaps uh, Mr. Chairman if it's acceptable what we could do is vote on the policy tonight and just for review bring back the procedures after our attorneys yep. take a look at administration revise it just FYI for us if that's acceptable to the board all right. all right we have both a motion and a second on board policy uh 217.006 service of uh alcoholic beverages any further discussion before we vote all right all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed motion passes please continue Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, next recommendation pertains to our initiative to maintain and upgrade our information system. Network infrastructure. This is under the annual contract for network and infrastructure equipment and services. Uh, the recommendation is addressed on page three of the packet. Uh, the interim, con the initial contract would be from November 1st, 2011 <clears throat> through October 31st, 2012. And this contract will, would be renewable for two additional years in one year increments upon the approval of both parties. We had 11 vendors, so it was a pretty robust group of people. It was advertised, all the proper things were taken place. So it is my recommendation uh, that we take the recommendation of the Management Committee, the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the proposed 
Pro proposal from CDW Government LLC for the establishment of annual contract for network infrastructure equipment and services in an amount not to exceed $1,050,000. All right, do we have a second? I'll second. I have a quick question, Mr. Chair. Yes. Since this bid was done based on percentage, percentage discounts, I assume it is off the a comparable bid base price right. so that we're really getting right. a better, this is the low bid. This is the low bid, right? This is the low bid, yeah. Right. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, on pages three and four, you'll find the recommendation for the renewal of annual contract for office supplies. Um, on September 17th of 2009, the trustees approved the establishment of an annual contract with Office Max for initial term of one year with an option to renew for four additional years and one year increments. Uh, upon, the, upon the approval of both parties, this is renewal for period uh, November 1st, 2011 to October 31st, 2012. It represents the second of four annual renewals. It's the recommendation of the Management Committee. The Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the renewal of the annual contract for office supplies with Office Max Incorporated at a total amount, total annual expenditure not to exceed $240,000, and I would so move that. Okay. Second. All right, we have a second on, on that. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Please continue. Thank you very much. Uh, the next recommendation pertains to uh, the renewal of an annual contract for captioning services. Uh, this perhaps is a little complicated and took a little bit of time to read through it for you, but essentially these are for uh, students uh, who are in the classroom and they're uh, real time captioning. The vendor's captionist attends a class with a student. There are two computers and this <coughs> captionist types in all of the conversations that are going on in the class. The student's able to read that uh, in real time and then gets a copy of that. It costs us, uh, uh, depending on the time spent, but at least a minimum of two hours at $100 per session. These services are utilized when there is a hearing impaired student who is not able to understand sign language, so that's kind of a special circumstance. Uh, in 2010, in January, we requested proposals. We had a, a contract established, and on January 21st, the Board of Trustees approved the establishment of an annual contract with CC Services LLC for a term of one year with the option for renewal of three additional years. So this is what we have before. So it's a recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the renewal of the annual contract for captioning services with CCC Services, LLC, at a total amount, a total annual expenditure not to exceed $100,000. And I would so move that. All right, we have a second? <coughs> second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Motion passes. Please continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'd like to point back to the minutes that uh, you have in your booklet, and you'll see that there was a discussion of housekeeping services, and we've had that discussion <clears throat> uh, for the past several months. Uh, we had, again, a robust discussion regarding uh, this, and I'll uh, defer to uh, Dr. Calloway to kind of explain the steps that we talked about and the administration is going to go forward with. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Dr. Drummond's request. Um, as, as we discussed in the <coughs> management committee this month, um, we were asked to go through a process by, by the board of uh, looking at our budgets, looking at places where we might potentially have opportunities to, to um, save money for the institution and redirect those dollars into instruction and other um, student support kinds of activities. And in fact, we went through a host of assessments of ways that we might do some of those things. Um, one, of the, one of the efforts that we undertook as a part of our PBS process was to look at some outsourcing opportunities for the institution. One, um, just one source of places where we could find funds to, to support students and in instruction. The, uh, the administration, through the process uh, that we use with PBS, actually had um, fairly lengthy consideration, discussion related to op opportunities that we might have with the IT area, with the bookstore, food service, and others. And really, because of the nature of how we do what we do, and um, in some cases, the profits that we make through some of those services felt that those 
issues weren't ones that uh, um, really would save us anything. In fact, if anything, may have eventually cost us additional dollars. Um, but we thought housekeeping was one that would be worthy of, of some extended look. So as you know, we spent the last several months um, exploring those possibilities. Um, we've had several opportunities to hear from our staff to um, get their feedback and, and advice. Um, the um, administration took your charge pretty seriously, and we, so we continued on with those, those uh, opportunities. And as you know, we've, we did receive actually five bids for outsourcing services. As we did some comparisons of the kinds of dollars we might save through outsourcing as compared to what we might be able to do internally through cost savings and efficiency measures, we found that we were able to save um, across the entire institution about $750,000 in salary savings. Um, about 550000 or so of those dollars came through some um, attrition that we'd had over the course of the last year or so within the housekeeping services. Actually, that attrition and some of those savings brought us about into, we found from the outsourcing studies, about it to the place where um, we were about, we were staffed about the same levels as some of our, uh, what we would have kind of defined as industry standard, but where each of those outsourcing services said for the amount of square footage that we have in our physical plant, we would, um, we would need, you know, as far as housekeeping services. So we, it looks like we're about the right place based on industry standards. The big difference between then where we are and what the potential cost savings might be through an outsourcing comes as a result of our very rich and robust benefit package and actually salaries that are higher than the levels that the, the um, outsourced companies would pay. And so, as you all know, the, through the conversations we've had um, over the months here in board meetings and also private um, discussions, some of the things that we've really been cautious about or wanting to watch are, in fact, the, you know, the extras that we get from people who know us and people who've been with us for a long time, and there is a, you know, some benefit to the premiums that we pay. Um, we do think that there are additional dollars that we can save through um, implementation of additional efficiency measures. Some of those things might include looking at how we schedule classes and the like that might begin to allow us to close some buildings earlier in the evening and adjusting some shifts to start earlier eventually shutting lights off at 2 or 3 in the morning as compared to, say, letting the lights be on all night. Uh, we think we can save, you know, upwards of a couple hundred thousand dollars there as well. All that to be said, we think that we can find some additional efficiencies and effectiveness uh, measures through some of the work that we're doing um, with our existing staff. Um, all that to be said, um, we also had pretty dramatic concerns. Each of the companies that we worked with said that they could maintain the cost price for about five years. What that have meant in real life is that if, in fact, um, some of our current employees moved to those outsourced companies, they would have taken a significant pay cut, significant benefit cut, and then have been frozen for about five years. We just didn't think that was realistic for anyone to expect to really happen. So all those things in consideration, also what the ex um, additional cost might be for us if we went to severance packages and unemployment costs and the like, we think that we'd be at least in the best and equal place by maintaining the course that we're on and finding additional cost savings through efficiency. So we don't have an action item on the agenda this evening because it's a recommendation of the administration that we maintain our housekeeping services as they stand with the team that we have in place today. And part of what we'll continue to do and commit to the board is continuing to watch where there might be cost savings available and put those into place. Um, as, in fact, we might have some additional attrition, as a for instance, um, over the course of the next coming years. One of the things we might explore is rather than putting on additional full-time staff is maybe deal with part-time support in the short run and then maybe start to outsource buildings um, in a building by building kind of a situation. But not, not to lay off any of our existing staff, but if it would happen as a result of attrition, kind of phase in an outsourced approach. That way, we wouldn't, have, wouldn't negatively impact the existing personnel. So, we think that we can find pretty significant savings, um, and we think that um, while this has been a difficult process and very trying for our team across the board, we think it was the right thing to do to do the outsourcing study. Um, but we do really have um, good confidence in the work that they do, and uh, so we look forward to the board's consideration of us continuing the path that we've been existing on and not move to an outsourcing mechanism for our housekeeping. So 
That being said, that would be our recommendation, which would mean that we would need we wouldn't really need a cause of, or an action by the board, just an informational thing uh, for your consideration. All right. Okay. Very good, Dr. Callaway. Any questions? Uh, I I just like to make a, a statement, and then I'll open up for for board comments as well. I'm uh, uh, very pleased at the way that the, that this has turned out. Uh, uh, I, I believe that we owe a duty to to both the, the, the taxpayers and to our employees, and I, I think that we've uh, found a very uh, constructive way here to to satisfy both of those, uh, and that we continue to uh, reap the benefit of our of our uh, hardworking and loyal uh, employees. And so I'm, I'm I'm very pleased with with the way that this has turned out. So so thank you for that report. Anyone else got a comment? Yeah, uh, Trustee, Trustee Musil first and then uh, Dr. Cook. Well, is it, when I first came to my first board meeting in March before the election and, and learned about this issue and members of the custodial staff contacted me, it, it was obviously that, obviously this was going to be a difficult issue for the college. And I don't think there's any more difficult human resources budgeting issue than when you're going to ask people to leave the employment of whether it's a private business or the college. So this was going to be tough. and. Uh, I think it, at, the, at most, or the best thing we've done here is at least allow soft landings through attrition or whatever. Um, I, I heard lots of complaints about the process. I don't think there's a satisfactory process to anybody when you're going through this. I mean, if we do it quickly so that there's certainty, then the college will be accused of not studying it, not taking into account everybody, not having a process. If we take too long, we left a lot of families in limbo for a long time, and that, that's unfortunate and, and cannot be an easy time. But I think the process ultimately uh, worked in a fashion that I can support the recommendation. I do think that, that the point you made, uh, Dr. Callaway, that you know it, it can't be business as usual going forward. I mean, we're going to continue to face the pressure to reduce non-academic costs so we can put dollars into teaching. Um, we're going to need the continued engagement of the custodial staff in finding ways to do that. And not just, this is not just a custodial staff, it's everybody that's employed here and those of us that are here voluntarily. Uh, so that engagement is going to be critical. Um, and we're going to have to continue to be creative to find ways because those dollars saved are dollars that we can help a burgeoning population of students um, that are already stretching us. So I, I support the recommendation. Um, I'm glad we went through the process. I think it's been enlightening to a lot of people about where we stand compared to the private sector. It helps us clarify our values um, to some extent, um, but it, it, it doesn't take off the pressure to continue to find cost savings, whether it's in housekeeping or IT or anywhere else. Dr. Thank Cook. You. Yeah, Trustee Musil has said it well, and, and I, I'll support the recommendation as well. However, um, I believe it's always important to be looking at operational efficiency. And sometimes, by nature, we become complacent and um, begin to take things for granted. And um, yeah, that's, that's just not what I would like to represent. And so I would always want us to be looking at how we can become more efficient, no matter what the process or the system is. Right, thank you, Dr. Cook. Anyone else care to comment? Right, Dr. Drummond, would you like to continue then? Hey, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and for those comments. I appreciate everybody's support as we've gone through this trying time, and I think we've landed in the right spot. I would uh, point your attention to pages uh, 12 and 13 in your packet for Capital Acquisitions and Improvement Status Report. Uh, we study this very carefully every month to make sure we're on schedule and on budget, and I'm happy to report to you that we are. I'd also like to point out that uh, the opening of the Olathe Health Education Center uh, is in, you've all been through it, you've seen what an excellent job Rex and his staff have done. We're a building we very be very proud of, and when you study the financials on it, the building that we built uh, at uh, much less than what we thought it might be, and that that's very helpful to do that. So Rex and his team have done a great job. If you turn to pages 14 through 16, you'll see another good job done by Denise and her team our IT infrastructure plan. Uh, again, IT systems uh, are kind of ignored until something doesn't work. And then we all kind of get pretty upset. And Denise and her team uh, do an excellent job of keeping people from being too upset by keeping the system going. <laughs> and so as we continue to improve the system, find efficiencies, obviously it costs money, 
but uh, I think it's a, a great benefit and uh, they do a wonderful job and so uh, I just want to applaud them for that. Uh, so thank you Denise and your team and Rex and your team for what you've done and that uh, concludes my report unless there's questions. If I might just Mr. Chairman, yeah, we, had a, we had a major scare this past week um, with uh, Denise and a uh, pretty major car accident. Um, mm -hmm. She through very quick reactions of her own, um, I think saved her life. Ooh. But um, we're very, very happy that um, you're sitting with us today and feeling better and back today. And I know you're still sore, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're very glad to have you with us. I would second that, wow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. All right, uh, learning quality is next and uh, Trustee Sharp, please. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not on the agenda. <laughs> you are. Oh, I am on the agenda? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, we didn't meet, so I have no report. All right, thank you. We'll move on uh, to uh, the Human Resources uh, Committee and uh, Trustee Rail. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the HR Committee did meet. We met on October 5th, and um, a large portion of the meeting was devoted to a very robust discussion centering around uh, a comprehensive compensation study. And uh, as you may recall, there was a commitment made by the college that um, once the Hay salary study was fully implemented, that um, the, the college would embark on a compensation study that would include uh, our benefit package as well as salaries to make sure that we were um, within market norms. And part of the impetus for that was, well, twofold, I suppose. Uh, first, that uh, because it had been a number of years since a salary study had been conducted at all, uh, the Hay study revealed that we were um, consider <clears throat> considerably out of disparity with the market, and it took us a while to catch up, uh, a while being uh, three years, actually, to, to implement, fully implement the Hay study uh, results. So uh, <coughs> there was a commitment made that we wouldn't wait uh, quite so long the next time, and so uh, it was the desire of the college to embark on that relatively quickly and to um, issue an RFP that would, um, in effect, break up that compensation study over a period of three years, uh, with the first year being dedicated to one segment of the college employee population and then the next year another segment, um, et cetera. And uh, the decision was made that the best place to start would be with the faculty. Um, it's my understanding, uh, and, and, and I think I was involved in some of those early discussions, that part of the reason the faculty was selected is because there's a relatively small number of um, categories of employees. It makes the study easier to do, and since we'd never done a full compensation study to include benefits, it just seemed like the logical place to begin. Um, there's been uh, a little bit of an expression by the faculty that um, they would prefer not to be the first group, uh, and as they have expressed, their reasons are twofold. First, that um, they felt that there was a, a, a risk that the compensation study would be rushed in order to have it completed um, before negotiations began, and certainly um, that might lead to some, some fault in the results, and so there was that concern. And then uh, the other concern would be that perhaps the results of the study, if it was completed in time, would drive the negotiations, and maybe that shouldn't be the thing driving the negotiations. And so I, I tell you all of that as kind of background of our, our discussion that ensued, which, as I said, uh, took a considerable portion of the meeting. And uh, at, at the end of that discussion, um, we kind of reached a, a compromise, if you will, in that um, it's it's we feel that it's prudent to move forward with the study as we had planned, beginning with the faculty as the first group. However, there's a commitment um, as part of that RFP process that uh, it will be allowed to run its course and take whatever time it takes. If that gets finished in time for that data to be available for negotiations, uh, then it may well um, be at least a part of the information that's considered. And if it's not gonna be finished in time, then we're certainly not gonna put it on a fast track in order to get that finished. So uh, as it stands right now, uh, that RFP process will be moving forward. And um, 
the, the vendor that's selected will ultimately determine what that timeline is going to be and, and how quickly that will be completed. So I'm sure that we'll be hearing more about that um, in the future months. Um, there was also a discussion of a new policy that's being proposed regarding social media. Uh, there are two versions of that policy, if you will, one that's applicable to students, one that's applicable to faculty and staff and uh, a copy of the proposed policies are included in your board packet. I'll uh, refer you to pages 21 and 22. Those are being presented to the board as a first read tonight because they are new policies. Um, certainly in uh, these times of the increased um, proclivity of social media, um, both in the workplace and among our student body, it's important to uh, recognize and make sure that we are in a position to address uh, inappropriate conduct that occurs on social media that may put the college at risk. So that's the purpose for those policies, and and uh, I'll ask that um, my colleagues take an opportunity to read through those as a first read, um, and then uh, we should be in a position to take further action on those next month. Um, we also entertained uh, several revisions to policies and. Uh, I would direct uh, your attention to pages 23 through, uh, let me get this right here, 35 of your board packet. And while it may look as though when you're looking at the page and you see all these lines and, and new type, it may look as though this is a dramatic revision of policies, um, it is actually a um, revisions that are designed to clarify and correct some syntax and semantic errors on the one hand to make them clearer and easier to understand and um, and then to make sure that we have proper employee classifications and things like that in the policy um, there are no substantive changes in any of these policies and so we felt that it would be appropriate to uh, bring these changes to the board as a recommendation tonight um, I, I hope that uh, you've all had an opportunity to read through those and, and again there are no substantive changes uh, in the policies that, that really would require any further explanation other than there were some things that were confusing or, or just minor errors that need to be clarified. And um, if, if it's at the pleasure of, of the chair, if I could consolidate these recommendations, I think that might... Um, and I believe those are listed on page 20. Do we have any objections to consolidating those into one motion? All right, please proceed then. Okay, with that guidance, uh, it is the recommendation of the Human Resources Committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the College Administration to approve the amendments to Board Policies 417.01, Voluntary Retirement, 419.10, Tuition Reimbursement, 419.13, Vacation, and 419.14 holidays as is shown in the board packet. And I'll make that motion. Second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motions pass. Mr. Chairman. Yes. May I ask a question about the compensation study? When, when you say the, 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 fa the faculty compensation study, does that include adjunct as well as full-time Faculty, how, are we are we? How are we parsing up the term faculty? Yes, it will include it will. adjunct. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I assume when we talk about comprehensive, the policies that we just passed, the rec, the, the changes in those, those are the kind of comp or benefit items that will be compared in the study: Hol vacation time, holiday pay, tuition reimbursement, all, uh, in addition to health benefits and retirement benefits and everything else. It's a comp when it says comprehensive, it means about every, every benefit you get with respect to the package. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sabbaticals also, I mean, things, anything that would be part of a right. compensation right. package. And the reason for separating is, you know, some of those are different for faculty than they would be for other employees. When I was, I was struck when I read the, the minutes of the meeting about that there was concern the, that these studies might become the focus of negotiations, and I, that's a good point. I think that's the point of the studies, and I don't know how they're going to come out, but the main focus of our 
whatever we do with any employee here in the next couple of years is going to be the economy, but the other focus should be <clears throat> this comprehensive study of where we are and what our values are and where we want to be in relation to the market. I think you, you all have done that in the past with, in response to the Hay study. So uh, I was a little confused when I read that. I think I understand it with your explanation today. And, and Mr. Chair, if I can yes. add, I, and to be candid, I completely agree with you, and, and that was a, a little bit of the focus of our robust discussion, if you will, is, um, you know, certainly I, I share your, your opinion that a compensation study should, in part, drive the negotiations as it relates to compensation. Um, and um, I, I expressed, I can't speak for Trustee Cook, but I expressed a concern that uh, if we were not allowed to, or I guess, if the desire was not to have us use a full compensation study in negotiations, what would we use, uh, given that there was some concern about the, the data that was used during the last negotiations? And so uh, I think that's certainly going to be um, a topic of conversation as we move into negotiations and, you know, what... Uh, what information will be considered because certainly compensation will be a topic during negotiations. And so I, I share your concern, and uh, that was certainly one of the issues that was being discussed uh, during our meeting. Thank you. Do you have anything else to add to your report? Chairman Weiss? Yes. Um, and, and, and I can't speak for Trustee Drummond, but... Um, I think that a couple of years ago, we began to ask the question, um, is whatever program we have sustainable over time? And, and I think with, with that, we've taken the approach that as we look longer term, is this something that we can, in fact, in reality, sustain two years from now, three years from now, with the resources we have available? And so I, I think Trustee Drummond put us on a, a good course in that kind of spirit. Thank you. Yes, Trustee Sharp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A quick question back on the social media uh, policy. Um, it, it links or it provides some very, very basic generic information, but then it says provide a link to the social media guidelines. Can we get a copy of those or do they exist yet? I think that's a work in progress, and as with as with most policies, oftentimes the policy comes first, and then those procedures and um, are kind of fleshed out as we move forward. So um, that piece, it's my understanding, is still a work in progress. Would that? Yeah. Well, and as it says in the board pack, that's exactly where we're at. Is um, the procedures are currently a work in progress based on some of the feedback back we get this evening. Thank you. All right. All right, seeing nothing else, so we will move to the President's recommendations for action and begin with the Treasurer's report and uh, Trustee Do uh, Dr. Drummond. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I would direct your attention to tab four in the Treasurer's report you'll find on pages 37 to 47. And uh, I will assume you've read every line and understand every number, but I'll just highlight a few things. So, uh, excuse, excuse me. me. <laughs> It's hard not to laugh right now, but I'm doing my very best <laughs> to keep a straight face and go forward with the very mundane treasurer's report. It's good to liven it up a little bit. Uh, our report covers the first two months of uh, this fiscal year, in, ending August 31st. Uh, you'll see if you have studied this report, which I know you have, we have state aid payments of $10,603,000 and change. We also had a tax distribution of about just under $4 million. Uh, that will actually be reflected in next month's report. As we've studied the expenditures, they are all uh, well within operating funds and budgetary limits. We're in really good shape there. I'd point out on page 47, there's some anomalies in terms of uh, when cash came and when cash left uh, per pertaining to financial aid. There was a distribution of cash in August and then received the cash from uh, the government in, in September, and that will be reflected uh, there as well. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out on 47, which is probably the very most important part, is that at the bottom of the balance sheet, you'll see unencumbered balance of $93,495,000 in change, and that puts us in a very good position, and I think we'll have a little more discussion about that uh, 
when we have our retreat in just two days about uh, how we're going to uh, respond to the nice cash, cash balance. With all that being said, uh, uh, our finances are in really, really good shape, and I think that's a, a strong, strong uh, uh, proof of the work of this board, the excellent work of the administration, and the continual work of all of us together to try to make our, our institution very strong and, and robust, as has been said tonight. And with that, I would uh, recommend the College Administration that the Board of Trustees approve the Treasurer's Report for the month of August 2011, subject to audit. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on that item? All, right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. And does that conclude your uh, treasurer's report? <clears throat> yes, it All does. Right. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move to the uh, month report to, to the board uh, by the college president, uh, Dr. Callaway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Under tab five, you'll see the monthly report um, for October. And I would just point out one or two items uh, on the first page. And I know you have a chance to read through that, that document of all the good things happening here at the institution. Um, and updates on all of all of what's going on, but I would just um, again point out uh, and congratulate Alyssa Waldman, who's uh, one of our staff consultants with the Small Business Development Center. You had a chance to meet her a little bit earlier today, and and we really celebrate her recognition as not only a Kansas star but nationally uh, for the work that she's done through the Small Business Development Center. She does a great job for us and <coughs> is one of those real stars of our institution. And she's been a tremendous asset as we've looked at how our college can become an economic development engine for our community. Also, uh, point out that the college hosted a number of events this month, including the Women's Heart Health event that was held on September 10th. We had 114 attendees. And the event was co-sponsored co with Women's Heart International. And we're very, very um, pleased to be a, continue to be a part of that, that group and, and work with them on keeping um, women healthy. Um, I congratulate Dr. Wolfskill and his team over at the Police Academy. Um, this, I guess about 10 days ago, we had the graduation of our 100th Police Academy. And um, I believe Dr. Wolfskill told me, and I think I saw a picture on their website, that he was in the first academy that uh, was done here at the college. And um, he, he really doesn't have much more gray hair today than he did back 100 <laughs> academies ago. He's done a great job for us when he's transitioned into that role. He really hits it out of the park for us. And to Jerry and the team, we congratulate you on a great job. Um, the only thing he didn't do very well that night was select who was speaking. And uh, I had the honor of, of doing that, that uh, presentation and sitting with Dr. Wolfskill that evening. One of the highlights was uh, the opportunity to have several of the um, graduates of the first academy in to visit with us along with our first academy commander and uh, i know he's uh, they're good friends with uh, dr wolfskill and they've been done a great job for us in our entire community so we just congratulate you and i'd ask us all to give a round of applause dr wolfskill and our team great job. <laughs> also our very own trustee musel was just uh, recently recognized by the Blue Valley Schools um, as one of the 2011 Friends of Education. And uh, we congratulate you on that recognition and, and uh, look forward to a great celebration um, and recognition of the good work that you do out in our community and particularly for the Blue Valley Schools and congratulate you on that. And then also, uh, just to uh, close, we did receive uh, notice from the county clerk that the 2011 tax levy rates are in and actually ours went down to look to Don Perkins by about 0 0.02 of a mill. And so actually what that means is that the assessed value for the county is up just very, very slightly, which is great news because yes. we're trending up rather than down. Um, and as you know, we started our initial budgetary projections with the projection of maybe as much as 4% decline. Uh, we narrowed that to 1% or 1.25, I think eventually to just a little bit um, under flat, and it came out actually a little bit ahead. So Don's done a great job of helping keep us, uh, keeping us on the right path and track, and, and the good news is that we're actually gonna have a very, very small reduction for our taxpayers um, this year. So uh, pleased to share that bit of information and, and uh, thank the board for their good leadership on that. And Mr. Chairman, that would end my report, although I'd have, had, be pleased to answer any questions you may have.
Dr. Rowan. Just for clarification, Dr. Callaway, we, we do have more than one academy class a year, right? Yes, sir. We have. <laughs> <laughs> to, to yes. I it, it wasn't 100 was. years of academy yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, as Dr. Wolfskill has yeah. kind of um, schooled me, we've averaged about four um, each year for a number of years. I'm not sure if it's been all the way back, but uh, when, did, when was our first academy? 1972. 1972. So. Um, they've 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 done a great job all the way through, great job. and we'll we'll get you all copies of the of the pictures from the website. World world class. Yeah, they are. Thank you. All right. Any other comments or questions? I'd also like to uh, uh, congratulate uh, Professor uh, Liker on his uh, new book on the Northern Cheyenne Exodus in history and memory. It sounds like a, a very interesting book. So. Also, Dr. Lecker has Bill Curtis in um, t tomorrow evening. He'll be doing a lecture in our scholar series, and we're very excited about that activity. So if you're a Bill Curtis fan, come and join us tomorrow. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, I don't believe we have any uh, old business uh, to bring to the board, and uh, I don't think that we have any new business as well. All right, in that case, we will move on to uh, reports uh, by uh, board liaisons, and we'll begin... Uh, uh, Trustee Dr. Cook with the Kansas Association of Community College Trustees. Thank you, Chairman Weiss. Uh, the committee has not met since our last meeting. Our next meeting is December 4th and 5th in Independence, and so we will be attending that meeting. Uh, I do believe, though, that the uh, presidents have been meeting uh, for a, a minute or two in the last couple days, and I would defer the latest and greatest to Dr. Calloway. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cook. Uh, yes, we've spent the last two days up in Topeka, um, interacting with the, both the regions, but also KCCT. And please report that uh, at today's community college focused event um, with the regents, um, we were able to have two panels that presented to the regents um, through KACCT. First was um, myself and Linda Fund, along with Rod, uh, Rob Edelston from Manhattan Area Tech, um, as we talked a little bit about the collaboration and coordination that we're trying to work on with our, our um, fellow um, technical colleges and, and the like and um, how we're working maybe more as a two-year system as compared to say working as 26 separate entities. I think it's a really good um, approach to where we go. Uh, the, the presentation I think was very well received by, by the uh, regents and we had an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, how the, the community colleges are able to um, respond to the 2020 um, uh, plan that uh, that the regions have put in place and most particularly talk about our relationship with building with our k-12 system along with how we're interacting with the regions and the universities on articulation and transfer um, we've also been i've been very um, involved um, in topeka with actually articulation and transfer committee we had a quality assurance meeting yesterday and then the full-blown committee today i think we're on a good path um, towards an outcomes focused approach to how we deal with this new articulation system and, and well we, there's continues to be some pretty strong pushback from the university faculty senate presence we actually had several faculty members from the universities today say that we're on we're following a good path and you know we need to continue on so um, th those those works continue to to occur and won't be easy but i think we'll, we'll we should be able to meet the deadlines and timelines that we're we've have set by the regents and by actually our board who's incur you all encouraged me to be very very active and ensuring that we get that articulation system um, in place um, we did um, get some news related to the dodge city um, lawsuit and uh, the judge has remanded that back to the regents now for implementation of the new uh, funding formula um, the bad news on that is it looks like we're going to be implementing it for this year as compared to last um, I'm sorry as compared to say next year so um, there will be some damages if you will that come as a result of a change in the funding we'll probably see some some adjustments um, to our budget we'll see where that um, how that proceeds Fred Logan was assigned today by the regents to be the um, regents mediator um, as the three institutions um, negotiate with the regents and the other five or six I guess six um, entities so we'll see where that one takes us um, I'm sure that story is not over yet, but uh, there was quite a bit of conversation. We are pushing to have all of the, the KACCT um, institutions join in the pain, if you will, rather than just being the, 
the institutions that um, have been involved with post-secondary ed. Um, beyond that, I look forward to um, going to Independence with uh, Dr. Cook, and if any of you are interested in joining us down there, um, your, the invitation always stands. So. <laughs> what are the dates on that? Four and five, December. December four or five. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Cook, anything else that you'd like to add to that? Well, thank you. All right, uh, I'm not sure that we have a uh, Johns County Research Triangle report uh, today. Actually, um, as you know, uh, Trustee Stewart is under the weather this, uh, this evening, and, and so he just asked me to share that there will be a meeting next week okay. of the Triangle, and we'll be, uh, um, actually, I think Dr. Sopcich's going to attend that for us, and we'll be bringing forward a report. They, they are not meeting monthly now, um, so this, that will be our first meeting in a while. So we'll have a report for you at the November meeting. All right, thank you. And the uh, Collegial Steering Committee did not meet uh, today, and so I have no report uh, on that. So that moves us to the Faculty Association uh, with Mr. Anderson. Um, Mr. Chairman, maybe as, as, uh, as uh, Jeff moves to the podium, I might just say that um, we, we did um, identify, I guess, late um, today, or maybe it was early this morning and um, late last evening, that there are some issues that We'll want to have some discussion on related to collegial steering, and so we were, we were emailing back and forth. Obviously, there wasn't a meeting today, but uh, um, as we start to begin our conversations around negotiations, we'll have a meeting probably in between now and the next board meeting to start to help us um, have some discussion around, I think, the interest-based approach. So mm -hmm. um, we uh, look forward to Jeff's report. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Good evening. I've had about uh, a little over an hour to kind of think of what I wanted to say here tonight. And I've been kind of collecting my thoughts as I've been in the audience tonight. But uh, this job that I serve in is, as president of the Faculty Association is, is a very difficult job and probably no more difficult than it was today. Um, in this role, I have to be you know, diplomatic. I have to be confrontive. I have to be forgiving have to be stern, have to be a mediator, I have to be collaborative, and I work with two groups that at times are diametrically opposed on, on issues, and trying to find a way to make it all work together. I also see sides of the college that are pretty, pretty unsightly, and there's times I wish, you know, that, that, that I didn't, that I wasn't exposed to that, but it, it's part of the job. And it, it, it's part of the institution. It's part of every institution. It's, it's not unique to us, certainly. Um, today, I saw a side of the college that I wish I hadn't seen. And for the past three months, I've been working with a faculty member in an advocacy role. My, my job as faculty association president is to advocate for faculty. I was working an advocacy role for a faculty member for the past three months regarding a personnel matter. The faculty member and myself received some feedback today on the conclusion of that, of that matter, and tonight I'm standing before you probably feeling as demoralized as I've been in probably 23 years working here. And I think the faculty member that I'm talking about here is feeling worse than I am, certainly, and uh, so I, I'm, I'm feeling a need to probably reach out to her tomorrow to see how she's doing. but. Uh, I'm sure I can't go into, into the details tonight with you about what this is about, but if you'd like to give me a phone call, I'd be happy to talk to you personally about this, to share um, my side of the story as, as it was presented to me, and I would welcome that conversation. That's all I have to say tonight. Does anyone have any comments or uh, questions <coughs> of uh, Mr. Anderson? Jeff, thank you for the hard work you did. All right, All right I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our uh, a new Senate, uh, student Senate uh, report uh, person today, uh, Gina Galanu. So welcome to, to the board. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Gina Galanu, for those that you don't know. Uh, I'm the new student Senate president. Um, before I move into updating you with the Senate, I would like to say a little bit about myself since this is my first meeting. Um, I am originally from Greece and I'm an international student here at JCCC. 
Uh, I have been here for, this is my second year and was involved with Senate last year as well. Um, and I am really excited to be here. Um, I'm hoping to major in psychology and maybe pharmacy, um, maybe a double major. Um, I am very involved with the school and I love to engage with students and help them. This is one of the main reasons I joined the Senate. Um, so now I would like to, to update you on a little bit on our latest accomplishments with this new Senate. To begin with, we are very happy to have finally our full executive board. It took us a few weeks, but we are have very motivated and bright individuals, so we'll hope we'll have a great year. Uh, we're also working on filling our two senator positions left. Um, and we have already started um, working on some projects. Our first um, service project for the October will be, um, we are trying to create, like last year, a safe environment for kids to trick or treat. Uh, so we are inviting um, children from TLC. Um, we are inviting students from the CLEAR program here on JCCC, as well as um, relatives of students of faculty and staff, or even the community. Um, and it's taking place on October 28th from 5.30 to 7, and everybody is invited. That's PM, of course. Um, at the same time that we are working on this project, we are also collaborating with the GCCC Food Pantry. Uh, we're trying to encourage students to both donate cans and also use them if they need. Um, and this service project in October will be an opportunity for us to collect maybe a little bit more food and get the word out there to students that are in need. Um, we have been engaging in fundraisers and we're happy to see that this year clubs and organizations are very active. Uh, we are having a great, um, out, like clubs and organizations have a lot more members than they, they did last year and they are very, very active. As the Student Senate has funded more than five um, trips and events for clubs already and we have more to come and are hoping to help them. Um, there was a request from students to have credit card machines on all vending machines and we did investigate that and saw there was place in order. But along with that, we decided it would be a, a good idea to see if we could look into providing more healthy options <coughs> and maybe um, cost effective for students in vending machines rather than just the cafeteria. Um, so we're always ready for new ideas and we're constantly asking students to provide input. We do have some suggestion boxes and they're always welcome to email us. Uh, we have set up a new page for them to reach out to us. And of course we're always open to ideas from any other member of JCCC for us. We thank you for your help and cooperation and re I really thank you for having me here today. Uh, I look forward to speaking with you and updating you in the next meeting. So if you have any questions I'll be happy to answer them. Any questions? No questions. Chairman yes. Weiss, just a comment. I, I had the privilege of dining with Gina um, the other evening uh, when we had the, um, uh, the dedication of the Olathe Health uh, Center and with a couple of other students, and it was really refreshing to hear her spirit and enthusiasm. And, uh, and uh, if I can share, you, you, you uh, were... Um, you were not looking forward to the day when you needed to leave Johns County Community College because you really enjoyed it here and uh, you shared some very personal experiences about helping students and I, it was really a pleasure for me to be with you that night and I wish you the best this year as president. Thank you, it was a pleasure as well. And you, you are standing at, at, at the, the end of the line of, an, of all very impressive uh, uh, student senate presidents that have come before the board. Uh, in, in the four and a half years that I've served on the board. And so I'm very excited to, uh, uh, to get to know you, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that we're going to hear great reports from you and great things about you uh, over the next year. So welcome to the Thank you. Meeting. I really hope to make you proud, too. Thank you. I'm sure you will. Thank you. That moves us to our second petitions and communications uh, agenda item on the board uh, tonight. Uh, this section of the board agenda is time for members of the community to, to provide comments to the board. Comments are limited to five minutes unless a significant number of people plan on speaking. In that instance, the chair may limit a, comments, a person's comments to less than five minutes. Presenters uh, may choose to speak at the first or second petitions section, but not both. And prior to beginning your comments, we ask that you state your name, your address, city and state, and do we have anyone that would like to address the board at this time? All right, and seeing none, I will close the second petitions and communications section. And that moves us 
to our final item on the board agenda for this evening, and that's the consent agenda. Those are typically items of a routine, routine uh, nature that we uh, consider in, in one motion. And uh, do we have any uh, items on the consent agenda that uh, any board member would like to pull or, or uh, consider differently, separately? All right, seeing none, uh, I'm open to a uh, motion to approve the uh, consent agenda. So moved. Okay. Second. Uh, and a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. And with that, uh, unless we have anything else to consider for the board tonight, we are adjourned. Good job, Mr. Chair.